Thanks, Maya. So the outline for today is firstly, Dr. Dixon will be speaking to us about how the OSCEs will be running this year, so years two to four. Um, and then Dr. Kashif and Dr. Watts, um, who are DCTs, will be going through some example stations and some top tips for OSCE success. Um, just before we begin, um, let's have a quick word from our sponsors, uh, Wesleyan. So thank you so much for sponsoring the event and over to you, Christina. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just really wanted to take the opportunity to wish everyone uh, in, in all the schools, good luck in your exams. Um, what I've done is popped a few uh, links and things in the chat box. So uh, you'll have my contact details um, and you'll also know where to go if you need any more information about Wesleyan. Uh, have a great session this afternoon. Thanks very much again for the time. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all hopefully at some point. OK, take care. Good luck, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, and now it's time for Dr. Dixon's talk about how the OSCEs will be run this year at Manchester. Um, so students have sent in questions beforehand. So thank you so much for sending in your questions. And Dr. Dixon has answered them on a PDF, which will be shared after the event. If you have any other questions at any point, please share them in the chat. And Dr. Dixon will um, collate all the questions and send them out. Um, and over to you, Dr. Dixon. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for organising today's event. I think it's a really good and unique opportunity. It's something that I didn't get as an, an undergraduate. I'm just going to share my screen. And there we can go from there. So for those of those that are um, across at different universities, um, thanks for joining. So. My name is Clyde Dixon. I'm a paediatric dentist by background um, and I run the exams at the University of Manchester. Um, with everything, there's lots of changes in terms of how programmes run. Um, but with one thing, OSCEs and communications are kind of vital lifelong skills, not only just for your exams, um, but for job interviews, but also your day-to-day -day treatments with patients. So I, I really stress when you're practicing and, and kind of revising for these, your learning skills that are useful forever. It's not just um, a percentage that you're not going to remember again. They're actually really important skills to go through. So in terms of dates for exams, dates for exams have, have changed um, because the components have been split up at Manchester. They're all available on Blackboard. Um, so if you go into your assessment um, groups within your year groups, there'll be a, there's a letter that's been uploaded on Blackboard for all of you to have a little look through um, and, and, it, and then it should have been emailed to all years as well. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the communication OSCE uh, and this is something that will be through your DCT years and um, Jake and Ma have got a really great programme today to kind of go through how to get the most out of it. Um, with COVID, everything's kind of had to change a little bit. And now we're looking at doing communication stations virtually. And that's very similar to what I do for a day-to-day -day job when we're doing new patient assessments at the hospital. We do a lot of remote new patient consultations where we'll have to build rapport up, not only with the parent, but with the child as well, to be able to do that dental assessment. So although it'll feel different and not like the real life that you used to have seen patients, it's actually a lot of ways how um, telehealth um, is moving for doing assessments. You might even find it if you go to your GP, you might be having a consultation um, over on an app on your phone rather than going into the appointments that way. So how the communication OSCEs are going to run at Manchester, they'll run via Zoom, so a software that everyone's being used to, um, but it's got a programme called Breakout Rooms, where basically you can split and move people into different rooms across. It's been used at the University of Manchester for their dental interviews, for medicine as well, um, to recruit students to join the university. So we've got kind of a successful um, history in terms of its and its rollout, um, albeit with much larger numbers than you would have for a dental year group. So students would join uh, a meeting room like this today, you'd have a briefing like this, uh, and then you would be moved into the OSCE room. So you don't have to do anything yourself, you're kind of moved and allocated across um, seamlessly. When you're in the room, it would be you, an actor, who would have their camera on, so that's the person you're having the consultation with. And there'll be someone examining whose camera and audio will be off, so they'll be completely out of it that way. Um, 
and then you'll have a minute to read a scenario and that we put put on the screen that way and then you have seven minutes to discuss through um, the scenario and discuss through with the actor who will be acting as a parent for example or a carer or they might be the patient themselves to kind of find out the information and devise a, a short treatment plan or provide some instructions to them within that time frame uh, and that will move from one room to another if you've got multiple OSCEs running at the same day that way. Um, so each one's about 10 minutes in total in terms of the shuffling from room to room. Um, but realistically, once you've logged on, um, you should move from one room to the other. There's always backup plans if things don't go to plan. The internet dies. The, there's lots of different options to redo the exams at the end that way. So don't worry about technical difficulties. These things happen uh, and we know it's not your fault. Um, I've, I've disappeared off a meeting many a time um, before and had to rejoin so these things will be put in place along with those for those students that might have DAS or extra time requirements they'll all be married in so don't worry about things like that they'll all be put in place and um, to ensure that there's mitigation appropriately. So the key thing, I just thought I'd do some points just from my own reflection and kind of teaching the postgrads at Manchester as well, because they have to do OSCEs um, for their MPs exams. Is It's about history taking, it's about making a diagnosis and it's about providing clinical information in terms that patients can understand. Um, with every scenario, the actor will be given a list of different topics and kind of themes and a storyline before behind, like they're um, an actor in a play. Um, and it's your job to kind of pull out that information, asking kind of open questions and explaining um, processes as you go along and ensuring that you check them afterwards to make sure that they you've not used any jargon there. Don't go into a hundred mile an hour spiel, just try and take your time while you're going through things. And especially with Zoom, and I think it's probably a good idea to practice with your colleagues as well. Take time to pause and then to kind of relay, is there any further questions on that topic as you move through? But these are gonna be routine topics that you're gonna see day to day um, in the chair with patients. So they're not going to be wild cards that you'll have never come across before. They're gonna be routine um, situations that you'll be expected to be able to be comfortable to manage in the chair. And that's what the process of this OSCE is. It's kind of a check. Uh, if we left you in a room with a patient, would you be happy at doing an assessment for them? And that's kind of this, this process to kind of check that you'd be able to do that or check you'd be able to describe a treatment plan that you want to do for a patient. I can't stress enough in terms of this tip of reading the whole question. I know it's always nerve wracking and I know kind of the adrenaline gets pumping and things like that, but just stop and make sure you've read the whole question. Because if you miss something out, then you'll just be backtracking when the patient mentions something that you've not read um, at the beginning that way. Because um, there's always clues in the, in the summary and the information there. For example, if the parents arrive with dad, you need to make sure that dad's got parental responsibility. You know, if they said that they've been in pain or they're really anxious, that's a big clue that you might want to find out more information about those things. So just really take your time at reading through the questions. And again, it's with that speed as well. Always introduce yourself. To, so just routine manner, always tell them who you are. Smile, be welcoming, because if you've got a stony face, you're crumpled in a little ball in your body language, they're not gonna give that confidence across when you're having that, and you're not going to create that rapport, even virtually um, with the actor that way. So they're kind of just really simple tips, but Jake and Mara will go into much more details about things like that. In terms of some questions about they have uh, questions about how is it going to be marked? Well, in your handbook of assessment um, for Manchester students, there's a, a plethora of information at the start and, and it goes through about how the questions are marked. For example, if you scored lower on one question, could you balance it out on the other questions? So have a little look through there to get, get more information of how all the psychometrics are done. But just in your head to kind of split it up and it's very similar across most kind of schools, there'll be scores for kind of key clinical information related to the task and so making sure that you're explaining all the right information. For example, toothbrushing, you're, you're going through all the correct information about what type of toothpaste, what type of toothbrush, how long for, you know, kind of clear things that you might find in delivering better oral health. So that would be the, the key clinical information where you get the main content of the marks. 
the next part of it would be kind of your communication style so and that's viewed from the actor's point of view but also the person that's marking as well so always remember that the actor will potentially be giving some marks as well because they're the one that's having the conversation with you so um, Manchester here they're kind of making sure you're using appropriate language and adequate explanation and developing a rapport so that's what you're saying about a smile trying to be engaging making them feel welcome um, and it's just a really quite simple scale of not achieved meets the standards that's good that's a pass meets the standard and excellent for those candidates that are really excelled and you've really got confidence in them if they were to see a patient for example in the next station and then this last one here is a global rating and global ratings don't form a score, but they work quite importantly when you're doing psychometric assessments. So you'll gain your overall mark from your main content and your communication. And then the global is just a gut feeling. So generally on how that candidate has performed across the board, not just looking at individual points, were they a clear pass, you'd had confidence with them, a borderline, so they were, for example, a little bit nervous, missed some key information, didn't create that rapport. Um, borderline fail like you didn't have enough information to be confident with them but not enough to give them a clear fail so that's just kind of a gut feeling that you've got and when you're kind of practicing with each other you've got to be honest with each other did you feel confident with that or of the miss really important things or said something for example dangerous which would fall in a clear fail so with an OSCE it's not about being anyone else. You, you do put on your, your best performance. So if you were trying to get the last table at a restaurant, you'd have your best charm on, wouldn't you, to be able to, to get it, especially when everything's opening up next week that way. And the idea is to kind of treat it like real life. Dentistry is a communication-based job. Um, so these are just kind of exercises just to check that you're just developing at the right levels that way. Um, a really good tip is to look on your trust kind of information website so they'll have lots of patient information leaflets um, so you can have a little read through of those and if just to kind of give you the prompt the ideas of what to use that are going to be a, a, an appropriate level for an adult or a patient that you're talking to. Use your common sense. It's not. A, it shouldn't be a difficult exercise. It should be um, just something that you have, have, have got the ability to discuss through. And as we said, with Zoom, you don't have to be in a suit and tie. But we want you to be something that's comfortable. You're not in your pajamas. You're not sat in your bed. You're sat at a desk, for example, and you're able to kind of engage across and looking at the camera. And there might be pauses, or you might jump over each other with Zoom and things like that. Don't worry too much about that. If you did do it, go, oh, sorry, don't know, and then kind of moving on from those stages. Um, the last little thing that I just would briefly mention is that obviously with OSCEs, there are sometimes some clinical exercises, so some clinical components that they'll test you to do. Uh, and this runs through again, not just as an undergraduate, but for example, if you were applying for restorative special, specialist training, part of their uh, assessment process is actually do to do some clinical dentistry in a set time frame. So that's kind of where these clinical components fit through. Um, with the students at Manchester, you'll be given themes beforehand of kind of what, what was likely to be assessed. Um, and again, in terms of the stations, you'll get one minute of reading time while you're sat in your clinical bay. You'll have a seven minute practical OSCE where someone will be observing you, providing the task. And then there'll be a two minute kind of changeover, for, um, for example, before the examiner's got time to mark and move to the next candidate that way. So again, kind of a 10 minute window for assessing everything. I really hope um, that's just kind of giving you a few bits of insight and I really hope you enjoy this session. I didn't, as I said, have anything like this whilst I was an undergrad. Uh, and I do think looking back, having someone go through about just practical things that you can do to kind of get into um, the patter of, of doing these communications and practice with each other. Don't worry about sounding silly with each other or anything like that. The more you practice, the better it is and the more confident you will be when you do see pa patients as well. Um, as I said, if there's any questions or anything from Manchester, or if you've got any questions across the board um, that you had further about us, because I'm more than happy um, to help um, and support you the best way I can that way. Um, I just want to thank you. I think if there are any... Quick questions that will go across um, to the students and then I'll be able to reply to them back in an email that way. But I'll stop the share and then I'll pass over um, to Jacob Maha. Thank you, Jacob.
thank you, Dr. Dixon, for that insightful presentation. Um, now we'll be having a talk by Dr. Kashif Amwat, who will be going through some examples and top tips for OSCEs. If you have any questions at any point, please share them in the chat and we will try and answer them at the end. Um, there'll be a lot of information in this section as well. So in terms of taking notes, don't worry too much as we will um, record what well, the session is being recorded and we'll share it at the end. Um, so thank you so much and over to you, Jake. Brilliant, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much again for sort of inviting me and Maha to, to talk today. Um, as has been mentioned already, I'm a DCT at Manchester Dental Hospital and I also graduated from the University of Manchester. So I've had sort of first-hand experience at the OSCEs. Um, so appreciate how sort of daunting it might feel if you've not done one before. Um, Maha, do you want to sort of introduce yourself before we start? Yeah, hi guys. Um, my name is Maha. I'm a DCT too. Um, I do peds at the moment. Um, I didn't actually graduate from Manchester. I graduated from Liverpool. Um, but like um, Dr. Dixon said before, OSCEs are just prep for communicating in real life. So regardless of which dental school you go to, if you're going to be treating patients, then hopefully some of the things me and Jake um, go through today will be useful to you across the board. Brilliant. So just sort of a uh, a slide on what we're going to be covering today. We're going to go over some top tips on how to be successful at your OSCE. A lot of what we will sort of advise has already been covered by Dr. Dixon. Um, then we're going to go over some example stations. Um, we've got three clinical skills stations with a practical element that we're going to go over. One written station um, and then three communication stations that Maha is going to go over as well. Um, obviously for the second years at Manchester, uh, university you won't have the the um, communication stations um, then Maha is going to recommend uh, some revision tips as well and we'll have a, a quick Q&A at the end so if you want to sort of um, type in questions into the chat box that's fine as well so top tips as has already been mentioned practice makes perfect so it's really important to specifically for the communication stations practice with your friends practice with family preferably from a non-dental background if you can because they'll be able to pick up on dental jargon and as my third point states there try not to use any dental jargon because in actor stations you will get marked down by the actor and by the examiner uh, for using dental jargon so that's a really good tip uh, and another thing to mention is try and practice with a timer as well, um, just to make sure you're not overrunning massively. So do know the lengths of the stations and practice with the timer. Secondly, um, the structure. It's best, again, with the communication stations to have a good structure rather than going in blindly. So when you are practicing, try and use the same structure each time. Um, a really good way to start is sort of to introduce yourself. So, hello, my name is Jake. I'm a third or fourth year dental student. It's nice to meet you. Please may I confirm your full name and date of birth. That's like a really good starting point and it sets you up for the, for the, for the station. Maha is going to go into a lot more detail uh, later on um, in regards to these communication stations. OK. Um, moving on. Um, keep calm and carry on. So if you feel you sort of had a shaky station, don't worry about that. Try and forget about it and focus on the station you're currently on. Um, most of the time you haven't done as badly as you may have thought. So, so don't worry about that if you, if you do think you've done poorly on, on the previous station. If you can, try and relax and be confident. It's best to deliver a confident answer rather than an apprehensive uh, one because the examiners and the actors may think that you're not really sure of what you're talking about. Um, and, and it won't really give the actor much confidence in your, in your, your ability, really. So try and give a confident answer if you can. Um, we've already covered this, but read the question twice. It's really important. Um, make sure you haven't missed anything. And remember that nothing new will be examined. You should have covered absolutely everything. Uh, so, so master the basics if you can. Okay. Um, lastly, I've just popped down uh, utilize station props. This is really important. So have a good look around the whole station. Um, in the past, I've actually um, sort of missed something before because I was in a communication station, didn't look around properly and missed the fact that there was an X-ray there that I could have used and that could have helped me uh, describe the patient's periodontal condition, for example. So do have a look around, make sure you're aware of everything that's going on within the station, okay? So now we're gonna move on to um, some stations, so practical stations first of all. 
Okay, so the first station is an oral surgery station. Now, I believe second years at Manchester haven't uh, sort of gone through oral surgery. So this may only be relevant to uh, the third and fourth years. So we'll have a bit of audience participation now. Um, if you write down your answer in the chat box, then I'll give you sort of 30 seconds uh, and then we'll, we'll move on to the answer. Okay, so please identify Luxator if you can. Yeah, that's fine. Lots of answers there. Um, so that's promising. Most people have said, have said A, which is correct. So we'll move on. A is the correct answer. A is a luxator. Um, just to sort of give this a bit of context, actually, probably should have done this before, but essentially I had a station very similar to this. Um, there were lots of oral surgery instruments laid out on, on the side and the examiner asked me to identify luxator. Um, so yeah, A is correct, B is a Kuplin's elevator, and three is a right, uh, right cryer's elevator. Okay, moving on to question two. Which number four set would you use to extract an upper right one? So insert your answers into the chat box again, please. It's a bit harder, this one. Okay, yeah, that one is a bit tricky. Um, so the answer is C. So well done to those who got that. If you use something like this, a resource like this to revise, um, it looks it looks a lot harder harder at first than it is. But once once you uh, sort of start revising, it becomes comes nice and easy. Um, so if you want to take a screenshot, I know this has been recorded, but feel free to take a picture or a screenshot of that. Uh, and lastly, they may ask you to demonstrate how you would use a luxator in an upper left six extraction. Okay, so with these sorts of stations, it's really important that you can demonstrate, but also describe what you're doing at the same time, because the examiner might ask you to describe um, what you're doing. So essentially, for these stations, I think it's really important to any sort of clinical practical station, it's really important to say to the examiner, you're just going to wash your hands. Uh, prior to popping your gloves on. They may at this point say, oh, don't worry about washing hands. We'll presume you've done that already for the purpose of timekeeping. Um, but just state that you would do that. And like I said, they may tell you not to. Um, but if they let you, then carry on, wash your hands, pop some gloves on, adjust the dental chair into the correct position, and then switch the light on. That's something that a lot of people miss in, in an OSCE situation. It's just like basic things like that. Um, so way to describe this, you'd say that you want the patient's head at the level of your elbow, place your finger and thumb of the non-dominant hand on either side of the tooth to be extracted. The tip of the luxator has to be inserted into the gingival margin buccally, so you don't, you don't luxate palatally. Um, the blade at the angle, the blade angle should be along the long axis of the root surface, and once in the periodontal ligament, the luxators work down the length of the root with rotation and apical pressure. And this cuts the periodontal ligament fibers and expands the socket. So that'd be a really good answer to that question. Um, I've, I've had to do this station again, and it was a phantom head on one of the dental chairs. So some tips just to sort of finish up on this oral surgery section is revise the forcep numbers, know how to use the forceps, luxators and elevators. There's a really good YouTube video from the Leeds School of Dentistry um, that demonstrates and describes the process of using luxators and forceps. So I recommend to go and have a look at that. Um, know what position you're going to be popping the patient in. And like I said earlier, make sure you can explain what you're doing and why. Okay, so we'll move on now. 
to a rubber dam station. Um, so the question or the, the sort of statement could be, you're restoring your lower right six with a direct restoration, please place a rubber dam. So same applies here, wash your hands if they want you to, pop some gloves on, adjust the dental chair, get the light on. Um, if you're restoring a lower right six for a direct restoration, it's a good idea to uh, punch a hole in the lower right six tooth, punch a hole in the lower right seven and the lower right five, so the teeth either side of the lower right six. However, if it was a root canal, you'd only want single tooth isolation, so that would be only exposed in the, the lower right six. Um, then you'd want to tie floss around the appropriate clamp. So use sort of sort of look at this um, this picture to the right hand side here. You just want to have a good idea of what clamp you'd be using. For a mole, it's one of the ones at the bottom. You can either assemble the clamp and dam together, or you can place the clamp on the tooth first and then pop the rubber dam over the top. It's up to you, it's preference. And then you want to flick the rubber dam over the wings of the clamp. Once you've done that, place the frame over the top, but make sure that the patient's airway is not blocked at the nose. So you might want to fold the rubber dam um, prior to placing the, the frame to, to make sure it's out of the, the way of the nose. Um, I've heard peep stories of sort of the tooth popping out of the phantom head, because again, um, this could be a phantom head in a dental chair and you have to lay the phantom head down. Don't worry if that does happen, it's obviously not your fault and the examiner will appreciate that, you know, that was out of your control, okay? Um, they may ask you just sort of to, to describe after that, I'm not quite sure, but they'll, they'll un understand that you didn't intend to um, sort of extract the tooth accidentally. Um, moving on now. Oh yeah, actually just one more sort of point on this, on rubber dam stations. I had a, a station where I had to take a periapical radiograph of a tooth with a rubber dam on, but it had a frame on and I forgot to take the frame off um, when trying to take a PA and yeah, that's just not going to be possible. So make sure you do take the rubber dam frame off prior to taking a periapical radiograph. So that's just a tip and a mistake I made in the past. Um, so the last practical station that we're going to go through would be a local anaesthetic or is a local anaesthetic station. So there might be an examiner there and they may ask you to demonstrate how to assemble and give an ID block whilst describing the process. Um, in my case, I had the station and there was a model mandible, um, but it, you, you may have a phantom head. Um, essentially, again, wash hands, pop your gloves on, adjust the dental chair switch light on if needs be. Um, you want to first of all check the expiry date of the local anaesthetic cartridge. You'll be wanting to use lidocaine um, for this. Um, don't use articaine for a block because it's neurotoxic. Select the long needle and make sure you get your left and right correct. That's a very common mistake in OSCEs. People forget the lefts and rights. Um, and understand what an ID block will anesthetize, what areas of the mouse it, mouth it will anesthetize. So your description may be something along the lines of aim 10 millimeters above the occlusal plane. You want to be aiming posterior to the internal oblique ridge, anterior to the pterygo mandibular raphae. Inject the syringe from the opposite premolars and advance two and a half to three centimeters. Once you hit bone, you want to withdraw uh, and then you need to aspirate. Now, the syringes we use at the dental hospital are self-aspirating syringes, but you do still need to mention that you would aspirate um, and then you'll de deposit a whole cartridge. Okay, so that again would be a good answer. Just some additional tips. Um, for some other stations that might pop up. For acting stations, as I mentioned earlier, a good structure, start off well and you probably sort of follow on from there. Um, Gracie Curettes, do learn the numbers. Um, I had a station where they asked me to demonstrate how I would use a Gracie Curette, so make sure you can do that. Um, impressions, make sure you use an adhesive, so with alginate, make sure you pop the adhesive on. Um, same with silicone impression. Um, if you do take a bad impression, don't worry about it. Just talk to the examiner about it. Tell them what you think, you know, what errors you think are in the impression and how you could improve this next time. That'd be completely reasonable because in, in practice, you don't take a, a good impression every single time. Um, irrigation, make sure you, cho you choose the correct irrigant. So sodium hypochlorite. Um, there's a really, if you want to learn a little bit more about irrigation, there's a really clear and easy paper to read. So it's called Modern Endodontic Principles Part 4, Irrigation, and that's by Dr. Darcy, so James Darcy. 
um, it sums up uh, irrigants really well. So if you if you want to have a, a little bit more of a read, I'd recommend to to go to go to that resource. Um, in the past, apparently there have been stations where you, you're meant to actually know what needle and syringe you're using for the irrigant. So that would be a lower lock syringe with a side vented needle. Charting, as I mentioned, get your lefts and rights correct. That's a very common mistake. Use a pencil, preferably with a rubber on the end so you can rub things out and just learn the symbols. It's quite an easy station that as long as you as long as you know, you know the symbols. Uh, and as I said earlier, know the concentration and the amount of adrenaline in your um, local anaesthetic. Um, and also don't use articane for a block. So we're gonna go over written station now. Apologies like, again for the second years, it's an oral medicine, st medicine station. I don't think you've covered this yet, but the structure is going to, you know, you get appreciation of the structure essentially. So the first question might be describe the appearance of this picture. So a good answer may be one ulcer is present on the right labial mucosa. There's an inflammatory halo around a yellow or gray base. It's oval in shape and sharply defined, this lesion is. Okay. Question number two might be, what questions would you ask when taking a history from this patient? So there are a few things I've, I've sort of jotted down there. Um, so the number of ulcers that occur, the location of these ulcers, do they, do they change location each time? How long do these ulcers last? If it's minor ulcer, this will, if it's a minor atlas ulcer, this will last um, for a short amount of time than a major one. Um, specifically with duration, if it's lasted for a period of more than three weeks, then you could, should consider an urgent referral. Um, diet, are they vegetarian, for example? Do they not eat red meat? So if they don't, then they might have an iron deficiency, for example. Stress, how, how is stress at home? How is stress at work? That's another predisposing factor to uh, ulcers. The frequency, how often they come and go. And the size of the ulcers, again, will give you an indication as to what type of ulcer it is. Other things you could ask are sort of empathetic questions, how it's affecting the individual, how it's affecting their sleep, how, how it's affecting their eating. Um, moving on to the medical histories, they have any medical conditions. So recurrent aphthous ulcers are associated with conditions like Crohn's disease, celiac disease, Bechet's disease. Um, so yeah, that really important to ask that and any medications or allergies as well. Third question, it could be give two possible causes. So there are lots and lots of different causes for recurrent after ulcers, and the question may be give only two. So that's quite promising that you've got a whole list to go off here. Um, we've mentioned a few of them before, but stress, local trauma, for example, a sharp tooth or sharp um, restoration, um, menstruation, sodium laurel sulfate found in toothpaste in certain toothpastes, drugs, NSAIDs, alendronate and nicarandil, smoking, particularly smoking cessation, we've mentioned Crohn's disease, celiac disease and certain deficiencies like iron, vitamin B12 or folate deficiencies. Um, you could also sort of pop in sort of um, orofacial granulomatosis, which is linked to, it, it's meant to be a variant of Crohn's disease. So that's something to sort of consider as well. Um, but for this question, if you're just listing two possible causes, you've got lots and lots to choose from. Okay. And lastly, you may get the question, give two management approaches, for example. So again, lots and lots to choose from. You could go for benzodiamine mouthwash, aka Diflam, some topical steroids. So this could range from hyd hydrocortisone oral mucosal tablets to betamethasone oral rinses, some covering agents, which could be lidocaine ointments, analgesics, paracetamol, um, avoiding spicy foods as spicy fuels or citric fruits, for example, may, may bring about some pain. SLS free toothpaste would be a good, a good um, sort of bit of advice to give. Um, Sensodyne Pro Enamel is, is one of these. Referring to the GP to investigate and treat any underlying deficiency or coexisting pathology might be 
a good approach to take. Um, there they may consider referring for some blood tests um, just to sort of look for these things as well. So they may be may, may do like full blood, full blood count, hematinics, uh, celiac screen, HbA, HbA1c um, levels as well. Um, now with with managing recurrent aphthous ulcers it's often finding the correct regime for the specific patient and not ev not one regime will work for everyone so um you may have to consider referring to oral medicine if you can't manage this locally as they may be able to investigate things a bit further and really important if the ulcer persists for more than three weeks consider an urgent referral for biopsy as it may not be an ulcer, it may be, you know, squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, we'll move on to the communication stations now. And Maha, are you okay to sort of take over here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like Dr. Dix mentioned before, your communication stations this year will be on Zoom. Um, so um, it will be even though it's online, it will still be the same kind of things that will apply. Um, your body language, um, your tone of voice, how you're going through this, how you're structuring your answers and stuff. Um, so what I'll do is I'll run through some examples. Um, and whilst we're talking through the examples, I'll try and explain um, an example of a good way to structure your answer so you're nice and clear and you get all your points across. Um, so this is an example station. Um, each station will kind of have a focus. So this station, the focus is pain history and diagnosis. Um, the station is, you've got a 56 year old patient who's had severe toothache for four weeks from his upper right first molar. So his upper right six, it's now suddenly stopped. And on the day that he's attended to see you, he's not complaining of any pre problems from that tooth. Um, he's also reported that part of the tooth came off recently whilst it was chewing. Um, it's given you an x-ray to kind of give you an example of what that tooth looks like. Um, <clears throat> they've also given you a bit about his social history. So the patient smokes 20 a day and he's a nocturnal bruxist. They've also given you a little bit of information about his medical history. So he's got atrial fibrillation and he takes warfarin for that and his BPE scores, which are twos everywhere. So when you're reading the station, like mentioned before, read it a few times because there's a lot of information to digest and pick out the main bit. So in this example, in this station, for example, you want to know which tooth you're talking about. You want to know a bit about the pain. So how long has the pain been there? What kind of pain is it? Is he having any pain right now? Um, and you also want to obviously take into account his social history and his medical history. So important things would be picking up that he's on warfarin um, because that impacts some of the treatment that we do, um, as well as the fact that he's a smoker, because again, that's a risk factor for lots of different dental diseases. Um, so the examples of um, the examples of questions that they might ask you for a scenario like this are to take a pain history, what kind of special investigations you'd carry out, what your provisional diagnosis is and how you'd manage the situation. And a really good way of structuring your answer is to go through the questions in the order that they've suggested because one leads on from the other and it will help you keep things clear in your head and not get muddled up between um, what you're saying basically. Um, so, as with every OSCE station that you're doing, regardless of what the theme of the station is, some things will stay exactly the same. Um, so treat this the same way that you were, you would be if you were seeing a patient in um, clinic. Um, the first thing you do when you see a new patient is obviously introduce yourself, um, double check their ID, because there's been lots of situations where people have similar names or the same name. And when you've called them out, they've come in at, only afterwards you realize you've got the wrong patient in the chat. I've had that a couple of times. So make sure that you're checking their full name and checking um, their date of birth or the first line of their address or something like that. Also double check their social history and their medical history with them. So if they've given you something in the scenario, um, a quick way to do it would be, I've had a read through your notes. Um, you've mentioned that you've got atrial fibrillation and you take warfarin for that. Is that still correct? Um, is there anything else that you want to add or anything else that I should know about? And that's a really succinct way um, rather than you going through all the medical history questions again. Um, same thing goes for social history. So just quickly mention, oh, you've, meant, you've, you've said that you take... Um, you smoke 20 cigarettes a day. Um, is that still the case? Other things that you might want to know about it would be how long they've been smoking for. Um, have they ever tried to give quit or anything like that? Um, and 
also in this in this scenario they've not mentioned alcohol but you would want to have an idea of how much alcohol they drink if they do drink um so in units per week um in terms of the pain they've obviously given you a few things um, about the pain history that this patient's experiencing. So just summarize that and say, um, I know you've mentioned a few things um, about the pain you're experiencing at the moment. Is it okay if I quickly run through some more detailed questions to um, further guide um, our diagnosis and treat the problem that you're having basically? Okay, so a really good way of doing a pain history is some of you might have heard this mnemonic before, it's Socrates. Um, so as long as you remember this, it's a really good way of working through things and making sure you don't miss out any important things. So Socrates stands for sight, which is where they're having the pain. So in this case, that would be the upper right six. Um, onset, when did it first start? So again, in this case, that first started four weeks ago. Um, the character of the pain, so is it a dull pain? Is it an ache? Is it a sharp shooting pain? They should be able to describe this in their own words to you. Try not to lead them too much. Um, radiation, is it spreading anywhere? Is it kind of giving them um, headaches? Is it spreading to their ear, giving them earaches? Is it spreading down their neck? Because again, that will help you distinguish the source of the pain um, and the type of pain that it is. Any associated factors? So are they having a bad taste in their mouth? Are they having any foul smell? So for example, if it was an abscess on this tooth, sometimes they could be tasting a bit of pus in their mouth, so that would leave a really foul taste. Um, and also have they noticed any sinuses associated with it? So the way patients tend to describe that is a spot on the gum or something along those lines. So that's what it means by associating factors. Time, so how long does the pain last usually? Is it a few seconds? Um, is it just as long as the stimulus is there? Does it last for hours? How, how are they going about that? Um, and also, is the pain there constantly or does it come and go? Then you've got the E, which is exacerbating factors. And the three big ones are usually hot, sweet and cold. But again, let the patient, just ask the patient, is there anything that makes it, makes it worse and let them answer for you. Um, and then lastly, just to gain an idea of how much it's affecting their quality of life and to be a bit more empathetic severity. So how severe is that is the pain? Does it keep you up at night? Has it impacted um, you being able to eat, drink, go to work, things like that? <clears throat> So um, that's the first question that you've answered. And in doing that, you've gathered some really good information um, and you can now move on to your next bit and it will be a natural progression onto, onto the next part of your, um, of your question, which is special investigations. Um, so the ones that I've highlighted in green are the ones that would be relevant relevant for this scenario they've already given you a radiograph um, but other things you could do is sensibility testing either with ethyl chloride or an electric pulp test to assess the vitality of that tooth um, you could also check to see whether or not the tooth is TTP um, because that would indicate the PDLs um, inflamed and again would give you an idea of what kind of pain is it is it pulpitic pain is it periodontal pain what's the source of that pain um, and you could also check mobility so um, the patient mentioned that they'd had a part of the tooth fractured off so what you'd want to kind of assess is if it's mobile is it a periodontally involved tooth do you think there might be a root fracture is that why the tooth is mobile um, so ask lots of questions and in your head that will help lead you towards some sort of diagnosis those are the ones that are relevant to um, this scenario, but if they gave you a slightly different pain history, um, then other investigations could be probing depth. So that would be indicated for periodontal disease or potentially fractures. Um, you could also use something called tooth sleuth. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but that's the blue picture that's on the side. That's really useful for fractured cusps. Um, you kind of put the um, spiky bit of the tooth sleuth onto each cusp and get the patient to bite down and it helps you identify exactly which cusp it is that's fractured. Um, and the last thing you could do if you were unsure of a tooth vitality status was to do a test cavity. Um, you don't do that very often, which is why we've not, we're not doing it in the scenario, but it is, an, it is a diagnostic tool should you um, choose to utilize it. Um, so <clears throat> then what you'd want to do is form some sort of diagnosis in your head. Um, so in this case, we know that the patient had um, pain four weeks ago. It's now settled. Um, from the radiograph, we can see there's quite a large radiolucency on it, which is suggestive, suggestive of caries. Um, so the most likely 
diagnosis is periapical periodontitis or pulpal necrosis, secondary to restorative, unrestorable carry, sorry. Um, and obviously you would want to try and explain this in layman's terms to the patient. So um, like Jake mentioned before, there might be some sort of props on the station. Um, so if you've got a radiograph or anything, use that to try and um, to try and explain to the patient. Um, so you could explain, do you see this large area of, of, of darkness, this large, large shadow that you see, that's that's the decay in your tooth, that's the hole in your tooth. Um, and it's kind of gotten to the point where it's past the point where we can do anything about it. Um, the reason this has happened is because it had um, a large area of decay there that has caused the nerve inside that tooth to slowly die off, um, which is why you were having the pain or any or the infection whilst the nerve was dying off. Um, so that's kind of, that would be more than sufficient. You don't need to go into any more detail than that um, to try and explain to the patient what's happening to their tooth, essentially. Um, obviously, when you've mentioned that you think the tooth is most likely unrestorable, you are breaking bad news. Um, so be empathetic when you're doing that. Um, do apologize and say, I know this is not the news that you might want to hear, but unfortunately, the tooth doesn't look like it's in the best state. Um, I'm not entirely sure if we will be able to save it. So try and be empathetic and acknowledge the fact that it's not the best news for anybody to hear. Um, the other thing that you'd want to do is not get completely caught away on that one problem. So just acknowledge, don't spend a lot of time on it, don't go into a lot of detail, um, but acknowledge the fact that obviously they do have other things going on in their mouth that will need addressing at some point, um, such as the BPE scores and explain that um, the PPE scores just basically mean that you do have a little bit of calculus in your mouth and that can lead to gum disease. Um, you're also a smoker, which is again a risk factor for gum disease. Um, so those are other things that we can talk about later um, and try and improve. I'll give you some advice if you wanted to improve on them that would make your um, the health of your mouth better in the long run. Um, the next thing you'd want to do is um, list the treatment options. So just to make it clear, this is actually, a, I've done this as a separate scenario because you're only going to have seven minutes per station. Um, so the first one that we did was pain history and diagnosis, and you'd probably end up spending your seven minutes explaining that to the patient and going through that in detail, answering any questions that they have had they have um, and then this could be an example of a separate station so I've used the same scenario just for the sake of saving time um, but that kind of scenario you could also get in the context of treatment planning so they might say to you this is the patient this is their pain history um, what do you think the treatment options for the tooth are and discuss those with the patient um, so in this scenario what you would want to do is list all the treatment options to them and a good way of structuring that answer in your head is to split them into immediate medium term and long-term options. Um, also, whilst you're doing that, you'd want to risk, discuss the risks and the benefits of um, every option and explain the whatever decision you take, it will be holistic, taking into account things like the patient's concern, their medical history, um, their oral hygiene, the financial cost and the biological cost of that, of that tooth. Um, someone just asked a question in terms of the special investigations do we explain that I'm going to take these special investigations and then go through each one or would you give the special investigation would you only use the special investigations given so what you could do is you could say oh, we've taken a radiograph of this we've taken an x-ray of this tooth um, and that's shown us that there is an area of infection on it that it does have some decay on it just to double check and see whether or not the tooth is still alive I'm also going to do a cold test on that tooth um, to see whether or not that tooth is alive and that would be sufficient really um, so say what investigations you've got and say anything extra that you'd want to do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, in terms of structuring your answer, what you'd want to do is immediate management. Um, so in the scenario, the patients mentioned that they're not in any pain, but if they were in any pain, what you'd want to do is focus on pain relief. Um, your initial instinct would be to obviously provide the treatment that would be best for that tooth, which in the scenario would be taking it out, but you must acknowledge the patient's medical history. Um, and in this case, he takes warfarin. Um, with warfarin, it's really, really important that you check the INR 72 hours beforehand um, because the patient is at a higher bleeding risk than your average patient would be. Um, so explain to them that because we don't have an INR within that time frame, unfortunately, we're not able to extract the tooth today. But there are other things that we can do to get him out of pain in which um, it which would buy us some time, um, which would buy us some time to decide what we wanted to do with the tooth long term. Um, 
So you could stabilize that tooth with a temporary filling um, or extirpate that tooth. Um, if it's unrestorable, then obviously treatment options would be monitor or extract. Um, but on the day you wouldn't be able to extract because of um, you don't have their INR. You could also do the AAA approach, which is advise analgesia antibiotics. Um, if antibiotics were relevant or um, suitable in the situation. So indications for that would be if they had a, a facial swelling, if they had a raised temperature, that kind of thing. Um, and if you, if the patient did decide that they did want it extracted, um, then you could also provide them immediate, immediate dentures. Um, the best thing to do in this kind of situation when a patient is coming and complaining of pain is to give them a cooling off period. So that's just a bit of time where the patient can go away, have a think about what they want to do um, and come back to you with a decision, um, which tells you the way that they want to proceed. Um, that's really important because when patients are in pain, they're often not in the right state of mind to make irreversible decisions like this, where if you extract a tooth, you obviously can't put it back. Um, so giving them a cooling off period is really important. So what you could explain to your patient would be, um, we're going to do whatever we can to get you off pain today. I can talk you through some of the treatment options and then um, you can go away and have a think about it and decide what it is that you'd like to do long term. Um, someone's also asked, why wouldn't we treat this tooth with an endo instead of an extraction? Um, in this situation, the tooth is unrestorable. You, we've kind of been told that by the x-ray. Um, if you had a smaller cavity or if... Um, uh, it was just, um, you didn't have kind of a periapical abscess or anything like that, you could of course try and treat it with the endo. Um, the aim of this scenario was essentially to use it, a, a, to use an unrestorable tooth um, so that you could have an example of talking through the treatment options. Okay, um, so once you've gone through the immediate treatment options, which would be getting the patient out of pain, um, then you could go on to the medium term, which would be things like extracting that tooth under local anesthetic with the INR checked. Um, just explain to the patient that um, they, they might require a surgical extraction um, and also they um, might need um, some stitches and um, some surge cell place because they are at a higher bleeding risk than everybody else. Um, quickly run through the advantages of this. So that would be getting them out of any pain um, and reducing any risk of infection that they might have from that tooth. And the disadvantages, which would be they'd have a gap where the tooth was removed, um, which they may or may not choose to have filled. Other things that you'd want to address at this point is um, don't spend an awful lot of time on this, but address the fact that their BPE scores are um, not um as healthy as they could be so um we can go through some oral hygiene instructions and diet investigation um before we continue with any other treatment that they might need um just so that anything we can do is sustainable long term and we don't get to a situation where they do have deep caries and do have teeth that need extracting in future um other things to address would be smoking cessation so this patient obviously um, smokes 20 a day so you could um, ask them are they interested in keeping in giving that up and if they are um, just explain that there are resources that you could direct them to um, where they can get help to quit smoking um, and they've mentioned that they're a Bruxist so you'd want to quickly just um, ask them a little bit about that so is that something that you're aware of is that something that ever gives you any pain um, and if you if it if it is then you could suggest maybe a soft splint for that um, if you did need to, you could also um, at the stage replace um, their denture for a better fitting one whilst you're waiting for bone levels to stabilize completely. Um, Long-term options would be essentially gap management. Um, so their options are, there's always the option of leaving the gap. If in this example, it's an upper right six, the patient might not be that fussed about um, it being on show. Um, the only time patients are usually fussed is when they've got quite a wide smile line and it's something that you can actually see. Um, so the option of just leaving the gap is always there. Um, other options you can run through quickly are dentures. Um, and the pros of dentures are that should the patient lose any more teeth in future, they can be modified very easily and just added to. And also they give fairly reasonable aesthetics. Um, the cons are they are removable, so not all patients get along with them very well. Um, they don't feel natural at the beginning. They do require some habituation. Um, and not all patients are keen at the idea of having something that they have to put in and out themselves. Other options are bridges. Um, so I've put two examples of bridges just for your knowledge. You don't necessarily need to go through this with the patient. Um, one type of bridge is obviously the resin bonded bridge, um, which is good because it does not 
damaged teeth on either side um, and the conventional bridge, in which case you would need to prep um, teeth on each adjacent teeth on either side um, to get a good fit. You'd want to run through the pros and cons of that the same way that you did for the denture. So the pros would be to the face prosthesis. You don't have to worry about taking it in and out and it gives you fairly reasonable aesthetics. Um, the cons of this would be, obviously our patient is a smoker and also they've got BPs of twos everywhere. So that's not, that's not optimum um, OH. Um, in this kind of fixed prosthesis, you would ideally want optimum OH. Um, otherwise, long-term, um, any treatment that you do is bound to fail. Um, the, depending on what kind of bridge that you went for, adjacent teeth could require preparation um, and you've got chances of damaging the pulp, so the nerve of the tooth dying off. Um, and because the patient is a smoker, if they did get gum disease, their gums are likely to shrink back, which would make the aesthetics of that treatment um, compromised. Um, your last option would be doing an implant, which is the ideal scenario um, in theory because it's got good aesthetics. It's a fixed prosthesis that you don't have to worry about putting in and out, and it doesn't damage any adjacent teeth, so the biological cost is low. However, this might not be the most optimum, uh, optimum scenario in this patient's um, situation because they are a smoker. Um, this requires really good OH. Um, so they'd have to improve their toothbrushing um, and get their BPs down. And also implants in general are contraindicated in smokers because there's a lower risk of osteointegration um, and a higher risk of peri-implantitis. So they can get further problems. Um, a lot of implant dentists will actually do implants in people who do smoke. They, that is something that they usually have to give up before this is an option that um, would be appropriate for them. And lastly, it's expensive, so it has to be privately funded. They're not available on the NHS for everybody. Um, so these are all things that your patient would kind of have to take into account. Um, this is what we mean by taking into account the patient holistically. So obviously, ideally, everybody would want an implant. It's the best option to replacing your own tooth. But in a, in a patient like this where OHI is an optimum, they are a smoker. This isn't the best thing for them long term. So you've got to give them all their... Um, all the risks and benefits of every treatment option to help them make their decision. Um, so someone's just sent me a message saying, is this one station? No, sorry, I did I did say that before, um, but I'll, um, I'll make it even more clear. I just used the same example for two separate stations. So your station one was your um, history taking and your diagnosis station. And then the treatment option station was a separate station. I just used the same example for the sake of saving time. Um, so this is our last example that we'll go through. Um, this is a peds based example. Um, and the themes of this station are treatment options and consent. Um, so your situation is that you've got a seven year old child um, called Amy Smith. Her relevant medical history, uh, social history that they've given you is that she lives with her mom. Her parents are never, never married and they're not together anymore. Um, and your relevant medical history is that she's allergic to penicillin. Um, relevant dental history would be that she's an irregular attender. The first time she attended was when she started getting pain from some of her teeth um, a few months ago. This is um, further information on the scenario. So these are the photos that they've given you. Um, they can sometimes give you either photos or x-rays. Sometimes they can give you both. Um, so in Amy's case, she's had a right-sided facial swelling two months ago for which her GDP gave her antibiotics after that is settled. Since then, she has had toothache intermittently from all quadrants in her mouth, and this has kept her awake on a few occasions. She's taken Calpol daily to help her manage with the pain. Um, and today she's attended a new patient clinic with her grandma. So again, when you read through this scenario, a few things just to be taking note of in your mind would be <clears throat> the fact that she did have a facial swelling on the right-hand side. Um, she's had one course of antibiotics for it. Um, she has still had toothache. She can't localize where the toothache's from. Um, so she feels like it's coming from everywhere in her mouth. Um, the fact that she's having to take daily pain relief for it, which is not ideal. And the fact that today she's attended with her grandmother. So um, again, you'd want to you'd wanna kind of investigate why. Um, so ex the questions that they could ask you would be to explain the diagnosis to Amy and her grandmother and explain the treatment options that are available um, to treat Amy's teeth. 
Um, so again, same as before, what you'd want to do is introduce yourself, um, check the ID, so um, check name, date of birth, and also just double check with the patient who's accompanying them. Um, so a really good way to do this would just be instead of saying who are you because sometimes I can feel a little bit rude just saying who have you brought with you today and letting the patient answer and they'll tell you they'll they'll tell you who's with them um and then just double checking um medical history and social history again um so after that what you'd want to do is just briefly repeat what you know of the pain history and ask if there's anything else that they would like to add or anything that you've missed out on at all um what you'd want to explain is that um, in this situation, you can use the pictures to explain as well. So you can use the pictures and they show quite clearly um, areas of, of, of um, carry. So all the dark areas um, and all the areas that are broken off on her teeth. Um, you can explain that they've got multiple carious teeth in her mouth that are that look like they're unrestorable and will need to be taken out, especially if they're causing her um, pain and infection to the point where she's getting swellings on her face um, and you can discuss the various treatment modalities and the risks and benefits of each one. Um, I'll run through that in a, in a second and um, what you'd also want to just explain to grandma would be that obviously you can give them an idea of what's going to happen but grandma is not able to consent hence mom or dad would want need to come in and sign the consent forms. Um, I mentioned this briefly before, but you'd also want to just investigate a little bit about why she's come with grandma. Um, it does happen quite a lot just because parents often struggle to um, get time off work and things like that, but you don't want to assume. So you do want to double check um, how come mom isn't here today? And is there anything that you can do to facilitate mom being present in future? So is there, for example, a specific day that you know mom has off or is it an afternoon or a morning appointment that would work better for her um, and try and facilitate that and make it um, remove any um, any barriers to accessing dental care um, that they might have as a family. So our treatment options would be um, essentially the teeth need to come out. How are we going to take these teeth out? Um, she is quite little, so she was um, seven, I believe, six or seven. Um, so you could do it just under local anaesthetic. Um, some kids manage absolutely fine. So you'd want, this is where you'd kind of want involvement from um, the family. So you would try and explain to them um, different different children are, react differently. Um, you're, you're the ones who spend the most time with Amy. So you'd be able to give us the best idea of what you think she'd be able to cope with. Um, she might be able to manage under local anaesthetic. Um, obviously, this would be the quickest way of doing things and it removes any pain or any infections that she's having. However, this would um, involve multiple visits because there are multiple teeth and we wouldn't be able to do them all in one go. Um, and especially for someone like Amy, who's only ever had a checkup when she's in pain and not um, much other dental treatment, it can be a lot to manage straight off the bat. Um, to make this a bit easier for her, we could do something called IHS. Good ways of kind of describing IHS are saying happy air um, or gas and air or happy gas. Um, and you just explain that um, she would still need to be numbed up and we would still need multiple appointments for it. Um, however, because Amy's not had much treatment before, if you think just under local anaesthetic, she'd struggle to manage, um, then um, having some happy is a really good option because it can reduce anxiety. So they're awake, um, but they do feel a lot more chilled and we can um, give it to them, give give them more and less as they need. So it can be titrated essentially. Um, so some people only need a little bit, some people can need a bit more. Um, the advantages of having happy gas over, for example, being put to sleep um, are that the appointments are quicker, um, and there's not as long of a waiting list and there's no recovery period. So um, you don't need any time off school because you can, once you leave, the, the happy air gets flushed out of your system at the same appointment and you can, um, you can leave and continue um, as normal straight after. With the general aesthetic, um, you'd explain that obviously all the treatment would be done in one go um, and because the patient's asleep they wouldn't remember the treatment afterwards so in a lot of cases this can be less traumatic um, however there are long waiting lists for this kind of um, treatment um, you do need fasted to, to be fasted um, which is six hours and a lot of people struggle with that um, and also ideally the aim of treating patients who might be anxious is to get them to a point where they would be completely fine being treated just by their GDPs outside. Um, so in a general aesthetic, no desensitization happens. Um, they're not used to coming in and 
sitting in the dental chair and having somebody look around their mouth um so essentially there's a there's a small chance that they would also always be needed to be treated in a secondary care setting should they um should they require any treatment in the future um <clears throat> they're the two the three scenarios that we've run through essentially um just some general communication tips would be focus on your body language so even if it's even though you're on Zoom, it still matters. Um, like Dr. Dixon said, don't kind of um, close yourself off. Don't cross your arms or anything like that. Be engaged, lean forward, try and have eye contact, which in this situation would be with the webcam, not with the person that you're looking at. Um, a really good thing that we got taught in Liverpool that I've noticed a lot of people do just naturally when they're listening is your head tilt and triple nod. Um, it just shows the other person that you're listening. There's been lots and lots of studies um, to show that it's a really effective way um, of showing the other person that you're listening. Um, the other thing that you'd want to do is ask them open-ended questions that are non-leading. So you'd want to say, for example, describe the pain to me instead of saying, is it a sharp pain, which has a yes or no answer. That'd be a really good example of an open-ended question. Um, other things that you'd want to do is just repeat a summary of what they've said to you and make sure that you've got your facts correct. Um, because you'll be nervous on the day, sometimes you'll miss things that they've said or you'll forget things that they've said. So that's a really good um, chance for you to summarise all that, consolidate it in your head and also give the patient an opportunity to add anything in case you've missed it or they didn't get time to or didn't feel comfortable doing that the first time around. Um, you'd want to show empathy. So like we said in the Breaking Bad News station, um, when you're telling someone, for example, that they are going to lose a tooth, be empathetic. Often you've got a checklist to run through in your head and you get kind of blinders on and get tunnel vision because you're so focused on getting to the end of your checklist that you forget that the person that you're talking to on the other end is a person um, and that you've given them some not very great news. So be kind and just acknowledge that and say, I'm really sorry. I know this might not be what you want to hear. Um, but the good news is we can get you out of pain and hopefully stabilize it so we can maybe stop this from happening to other teeth in the future. Like it's been mentioned before loads of times, avoid any jargon. Um, so for example, simple things saying like things like x-rays instead of radiographs um, and trying to say decay instead of caries, little things like that, that will help um, patients understand you a little bit better. A really good way of getting around this as well is to get is to start practicing with your family and your friends, especially your non-dental family and friends, and trying to explain, for example, x-rays to them or different treatment options to them. Like try and try and explain an, a root canal treatment and the steps that you would go through um, to someone in your household that's not a dentist, that's not a medic, and see if they understand what you're talking to them about. Um, sometimes what you'll find is they'll give you ways of, of um, terms that you can use and things to make um a patient's understanding a little bit better and maybe you can steal them and incorporate them into when you're talking. All the things that you can do is chunk and check. So um, don't throw a load of information at them. It's really hard to digest and um, break it into little digestible sections. So for example, after every treatment option, pause for a second, take a breath. It'll give you time to collect your thoughts. It'll also give the patient a bit of time to um, absorb everything that you've said um, and just double check is that clear so far is there anything that you'd like to ask me or is there anything that I've not made clear and then lastly what you could do is refer them to resources so patient information leaflets there's lots of websites that go through information as well um, and videos on pages like the BSPD and things like that Um, so some useful revision resources for you guys um, would be things like FGDP guidelines. They go through um, very detailed sections on record keeping, examination, radiographs. So hopefully um, it should be it should give you an idea of how to structure your answer. And also it will be good for general exam revision and um, writing notes and things like that. The SDSEP guidelines, they've got some really good guidelines on things like antibiotics and stuff like that. Um, so again, it would give you more of an idea of when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate. Delivering better oral health toolkit, this is just um, bread and butter stuff. So delivering better oral health, should, it'll be something that you'll find useful everywhere, not just for this OSCE. It's got all your basic prevention advice, your toothbrushing advice, your amount of fluoride that you need and things. Um, so make sure you've got a really good idea of um, of that it also goes through kind of um different treatment options for ch children that are high risk or um and it, it separates them by age so it'll tell you for example um between 10 to 16 the amount of durafat toothpaste that you'd use which is 28 
um, 100 ppm, anyone above 16 um, 5,000 ppm. So getting all your numbers like that, um, it's a really good resource and it summarizes everything really well. Um, your GDC principles are always really good. Um, MFT leaflets. So I think Dr. Dixon mentioned them before, but here's the link for them. Um, so these are all your patient information leaflets. Um, they're designed to give patients information in layman terms. So if you are struggling on how to explain um, a procedure or explain risks and benefits or everything, they're a really good resource to check because they'll have really patient friendly language in them. And then the last one is a website that I found called Geeky Medics. Um, I used this when I was revi revising for my OSCEs. It's essentially a medic based website but they do have a small dental section um it gives you example scenarios and also gives you just general communication tips so they'll give you model answers and um run through things um do's and don'ts for different scenarios um they might not all be relevant because their medical skills are not dental um but there will still be some some overlap that you might find useful lastly good luck um for a lot of you, this is the first time you'll be doing an OSCE and obviously having it on Zoom is a big change to, to what you might be used, used to before, but you'll be okay. You'll be okay. Just keep calm and carry on.